basically we have big questions so big questions uh, the first context is that there is an ongoing debate right now where, why we have a crisis why we have the great recession there are lots of debates going on. One particular factor which has been discussed is inequality. The Joseph Stiglitz, Nobel, laureate, uh, Nobel Prize laureate, he uh, recently published a book on the price of inequality. Basically, he's saying, at least in the US, in, in, in inequality is the key factor of the crisis. But the debates are going on. Some others say, well, well, no, Stiglitz, you, of, of course, you got the Nobel Prize, but which does not mean you are right on everything saying, you know, inequality, yes, something, but it's not really a key factor. Then, again, debates are going on. This actually brings us to the question, very class question, does inequality really matter? Many people accept, you know, economists and or social, social scientists and all the all ordinary people may accept the fact, yes, inequality matters for social and political reasons, yes. But when it comes to economics, People say, people have different views. Well, 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 I can accept it for social reasons, but not necessarily for economic reasons. Too low inequality may suppress economic growth. That is one standard argument. And then it's this, and the third one is more related to the uh, economist thinking. I'm economist, so I'm trained in that way. The, probably, I don't know the, how familiar you are with the economics. If you look at the so-called macroeconomics, that is very hidden. You never know. It's always hidden in deep place. Bad assumption that the functional income distribution, functional income distribution is basically the income distribution between capital and labor is always stable. That's the standard assumption underlying mainstream macroeconomics. We assume them for the last 20 or 30 years, at least. But now, I'm, what I'm going to do in, the, in my presentation, uh, that the, this is not the case. Actually, the functional income distribution can change, actually have changed. Then if we found that, then what does that mean? So I'm getting into that as well. And all of this to actually lead us to the, our more fundamental questions that the probably whether or not we need some new socioeconomic paradigm, because the paradigm, which exists, I don't know how to name it, but something that exists may not be very, uh, uh, have done a very good job, so we have to change the paradigm. Otherwise, we'll get back to the same problem and again and again and again and again. So what would that be then? So that is my big questions. And the, in the doing this, the, we uh, published quite a, a number of the articles and reports. I uh, just uh, the, the for simply for the promotion purposes, you can see one is Global Wage Report, which just came out the last December. On the right, there is a special issue of the in International Labor Review, uh, which focus on the low pay issues in low income countries or the emerging uh, economies. So uh, I'm going to. Uh, circulated some the hard copies of this uh, this uh, report and the uh, the journal. And what I have found, I just put up front what I have found. Uh, I'm afraid after raising big questions, what I have found is very small. So I I have to apologize for that. But we are keep thinking about the big questions, but we are doing small things. At the end of the day, these all small findings will actually pave the way to some of the big ideas and big plans. Uh, there are very four uh, the issues. One is what happens. First, labor income share, I'm going to explain later, has been declined. Not just in the industrial countries, also low income countries and developing countries. Personal income distribution also got worse. Why? Of course, you may ask. Of course, a wide range of factors played, but many people point to the role of the technological changes, but our view is slightly different. We think the policies play probably a bigger role than technological changes. Then why are people talking about technological changes all the time? Economists always love to talk about technological changes for one simple reason. If you say technological changes, you immediately say, oh, I'm sorry, what happened, but there is nothing we can do about this. Come on, how can he 
how to change the technology, that's not our job, right? So it's like uh, the natural law. So that's why we, we economists love technological changes. But our finding is, well, there is some element of technological changes, but that's not the whole story. But actually, that's a very small part of the story. And the third one is, oh, of course, this uh, labor income share is increasing, income distribution got actually more worse than what is the implication? Of course, social implication, yes. Political implication, yes. But that's not the focus of my presentation. My presentation is basically saying income inequality is growing, then it may lead to lower economic growth and economic stability. So income, widening income equality is also economically bad. That's the, our argument. And then I finally I will touch upon the more difficult question for me. So what to do? You have said very nice things about, so what? So I'm touching upon those issues, focusing on the notion of the rebalancing. They're basically rebalancing, meaning the rebalancing in income distribution at the national and global level through more effective policy intervention. Uh, I'm going to use the, some different concepts here and there, just probably use, many of you are already quite familiar with this, but just to, to make sure we're on the same page, uh, the, I'm using, uh, I'm, I'm referring to two different types of the income distribution. One is a primary income distribution, and the se second is a secondary income distribution. In the primary income distribution, there are two parts. One is how to divide the total output or total incomes between capital and labor. The second is how to, uh, how to actually the distribute the workers' portion, total portion, among workers. So it's more wage inequality. So there are two different things. Of course, they are related. Uh, of course, the secondary income distribution, I think honestly is more interested in this topic, but I don't want to the, uh, get into the detail there. And also I'm going to use some of the economic terms called aggregate demand, it's basically GDP. GDP is a typically the composed with the, uh, composed of the, composition, uh, the consumption and investment, export, import, and government. Okay, so I hope this is clear to you. And then they, I'm getting into the uh, major, uh, the main part of my presentation. Uh, why I'm talking about inequality? Uh, I don't know the unrest and the in the so, in the social policies that you are talking about these issues in that perspective. But as far as economists is, is concerned, inequality is not really important issues. Ah, uh, no. Okay, I, I'll correct it. Inequality has not been an important issue so far. There are many, many reasons for that. One reason is the, uh, because of the famous actually Kuznets curve. People, we were taught in our in, in you know, the PhD or in the university say, at the early stage of industrialization, inequality will inevitably increase. But the growth continues at the end of the day, at a certain point then the inequality start to decline. So the, what you have is, for, first it's increasing and then declining at a certain stage of economic growth. So if that's the case, if we consider that as kind of natural law, that is always happening, then we really don't need to worry about this. So that's why, that's one of the reasons why economists are, are not very much interested in inequality. But, that's a nice theory. Uh, it has uh, some evidence, but uh, there, we look at the, what evidence we have on that. The, our answer is no. Uh, the the Kuznets may have lied to us, or he got the wrong data. I don't know what happened to him, uh, but uh, we found the evidence which is not actually supportive of his, uh, the, his Kuznets curve. But I'm, he, that's not his fault. I'm getting there later. Uh, in my presentation. And then the, once actually economists all of a sudden realize, oh, the evidence is different. No, that's not quite the, what we have expected. Then economists are always smart and proposing some new strategy, say, look, there are two different types of inequality. One is good inequality, the other is bad inequality. So good inequality, if good inequality in the sense it provides an incentive 
for workers to work harder. So if you get more salaries, and you may work harder. Compared to the situation, everybody paid exactly the, the same. And the bad inequality is basically somehow the, you're trying to intervene the directly in the income distribution. That's a kind of the policy intervention trying to address. Uh, that is kind of the, the notion came from the, uh, you know, basically trying to link that to the, uh, the notion of the bad inequality. This is the old context. As you see, this is a graph. I put the, we put it the uh, economic growth on the, on the y-axis, this Gini coefficient. Uh, you may not see the clear patterns. If Kuznets is right, then we have to expect something like this. Uh, but what we have found is a bit of cyclical. It's up and down, up and down kind of thing. So we don't know exactly what is the relationship between the two. That's the context number one. The second is about the wage inequality. I'm probably, I don't need to spend much time on this. It's simple. There are so many different <coughs> ways of the measuring the, income, uh, the wage inequality. One is just purely looking at the bottom scale or bottom part of the labor market, low pay. It's typically defined by the two thirds of the median wages. When we look at that, low pay is increasing everywhere. At least two thirds of the countries around the world right now have seen the pay, low pay incidence increasing. And another way of looking at it is what we call the decile ratio. The top wage earners and the, the lowest the paid earners, we compare what is the gap. Again, the same story, it's increasing everywhere. So that's context to number two. Which all of this, all of this, first, a very ambiguous relationship between inequality and growth, and the second is the in growing inequality among wage earners, is fundamentally related to the, what I call the functional income distribution or the labor income share. Labor income share is the, the portion of the total compensation basically paid by the companies as part of the total uh, the, the national income. As I said, economists always say it's stable because the, the capital labor is always negotiating over the total output. So the, the division weight, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the share the each party will take will be the same. But as you can see, is it clear to you? Uh, because there is an, the color is not very uh, clear, but I, anyway, I'm going to explain. Labor income share in the most advanced countries has, uh, has been increasing until 1970s, the late 1970s. Then there is a big turnaround around the 1980s. And uh, since then, in all countries, without any exception, they're all the decreasing trend in the most of countries. You may say this is only for the industrial countries. Uh, possibly yes, but not always. The, as if this is the, all the, uh, the data from the different countries. As you can see, there is some the downward trend until the uh, 1980s, around the mid-1980s, and then start to increase a little bit. But for some reason, I'm going to explain later, for some reason around the 1990s, not 1980s, in the industrial countries, about the 1990s, uh, all of a sudden, decline trend started. So this is the same story. And you may, you may be interested in China, the same story. China, around the, until the overtrend is declining, but that trend has been particularly uh, strong the, around the uh, 2000s. So that declining trend continued even now in China. So all of all, we have strong evidence that labor income share has not been stable. Actually, it has been uh, decreasing very significantly in most of the countries. Very significantly? Yeah. It goes from 70 to 65 in f half a century. No, actually, it's more than that, actually. So here, so you can see. Here the no, but the one before. One before. So I'm getting so into the... basically is from 70 to, to the, uh, 65 in 40 years. 
the, if you start with the 1980s. Oh, okay. Yes, yeah, okay. so, so yeah. that's it, okay. I have not been briefed on the misdeeds of statisticians. Ah, I'm sorry. That. That's my fault, don't be <laughs> worried. <Okay. laughs> I have to, yeah, I should explain more actually, uh, in further details, but that's my fault actually. And why this happened? The critical reason is that probably you, if you learn actually economic theory, you, the first thing you will learn is that wages will be determined by labor productivity, for sure. So what are wages? Wages are the, the portion workers will receive in return for their contribution to total output. So that's labor productivity. So by definition, the wages should be in line with labor productivity. But that is exactly where it went wrong. This is the, the index we calculated for the last uh, almost the, uh, uh, 12 years or so, comparing labor productivity and wages. The line below, the, the, the bottom line is basically the real wage growth. The line, the up top line is the labor productivity growth for the last 12 years. As you can see, there is a gap between wages and labor productivity. There is no sign of narrowing. It's simply growing over the years. Still, actually, when we have the crisis in the 2007 and 8, we expected that that gap may be narrowing down, but that's not what we have. That that's not what happened. So we are wrong. And uh, so the there is no sign of the uh, actually of reversing this trend at the moment. Think, probably you can think of this way: if workers receiving less than labor productivity, what's going to happen? That gap that gap is taken by capital. So that's why all of a sudden we see the big changes in the functional income distribution. So capital sh uh, profit share is increasing and labor income share is falling, simply because of the increasing gap between wages and productivity growth. Then the next question, why did that happen? Why economists are wrong? All the assumption is wrong. Why the workers all of a sudden uh, did not receive the probably what they deserve to be paid. And there are lots of factors like uh, technological changes, globalization and financialization, labor market institution and the welfare side. Right now there are lots of studies on this. So I'm going to summarize some of them, but I just present our own findings, which is a bit different from the standard views, but we, we are quite confident the, our findings are very rigorous and solid. At, at the end of the story, in here is the most tricky part is the, you have to think about yourself how wages are determined. Many people say the wages are determined by market. But if we believe that, that there should be some consistency between wage growth and labor productivity growth, but it didn't happen. So we suspect that has something to do with the changes in the bargaining position between workers and employers. But it's interesting enough, the, all the factors we identify, like globalization and financialization, and market institution, welfare states, and social policy will all affect the bargaining position of workers for the last, uh, 20, uh, last two decades. So what is our result? We have, we have done lots of the number crunch work, like for the last uh, 30 years, uh, creating some of the panel data. Uh, we run the, about the 100 regression over there. This is the final result. We also surprised by the finding. The most important single factor which can explain the declining labor income share is financialization. So the more enterprises are exposed to finance sector and also influenced by finance sector, their decision, and also their exposure to some countries exposure to other countries in terms of financial transaction. That is the most important. About this 46 46% uh, of the decline can be explained by this. The next is, as expected, labor market policies and social policies and welfare policies all together. That's about 25%. The next one is the globalization, which is measured by the total, uh, the sum of the export and import uh, out of the total GDP. So the exposure of the uh, countries to the uh, external trade. But surprisingly, only 10% can be explained by technological changes. So from this, we say 
probably the, the decline in labor income share has more to do with the policies rather than the technological changes. Why we call the policies for this financialization, labor market, and the globalization simply because the, it has something to do with the policy shift in the financial market regulation and labor market regulation and also the social policies in general. <coughs> Then, okay, having said this, okay, this is all nice story. It's probably it may not matter that much. Because they, at the end of this inequality, so, so what? And so to address those issues, we're trying to see how, what is the economic consequences of the declining labor income share. So this is the frame we have. So if there is changes in labor income share, think uh, I'm trying to explain rather in plain, uh, in a like, simple way. Le if the labor income share is falling, so the workers, general as a whole, have received small part of the total income, which means they have less to spend. So, so the declining in the labor income share will reduce consumption, right? But then you can expect some problem. But that, that's not the end of the story. The other side of the story is that the, because the, there is an increase in the profit share, then companies will have more resources to invest. So you may expect the falling level income share may boost actually the investment. So it depends on which one is bigger than the other in the end. And also the, if the uh, labor income share is falling, so we call it unit labor cost is falling as well. So then may actually boost the actual exports and a bit reducing the import. So we expect some uh, positive impact on that export. So in our view, at the end of the day, how actually this actually uh, changes in income distribution will affect economic growth is basically a matter of the empirical question. So that's why we did. Uh, can you see the figure? Okay. So to get, again, we look at the old uh, big macro data for the last 30 years to estimate the, the impact of the, the labor income share changes on its macro factors. Uh, the first thing we found is the, the effect on consumption is very large. It's if the labor income share is uh, falling by 1%, it will reduce consumption by I, between 0.3 and the 0.5 percent, so it's a big impact. So that's uh, what actually the the second actually column actually tells us. And as I said, if the labor income share is falling, union labor cost is actually decreasing, then investment will increase. That's what we expect to happen. But surprise, surprise, that didn't happen. Profit share is increasing, but that doesn't translate into the higher investment. So as you can see in the third column, some countries like uh, the United States and also Korea and some other countries like even the United Kingdom and Turkey in some different countries, even if the profit share is increasing, there is no impact on the investment. So which basically meaning the company is actually keeping all the increase of the profit share either in cash or putting the money in other places. So where have they put the money? That is the question. So the answer is, of course, financial sector. There is some the positive uh, impact on net exports, but altogether, if we actually put together all this if effect, the answer is simple. The if labor income share is declining, then the economic growth will suffer. That's what we found from the, our macro analysis. So the worsening or growing uh, income inequality is economically uh, negative. So that is not just the social. Then how countries manage that, all these problems? So, OK, I'm trying to guide you a little bit. So consumption is falling like this. And investment actually don't increase that much then you have a problem with the aggregate demand. You have to compensate it somewhere. Otherwise, your economy would collapse. Then the question is, how countries manage to handle this problem? There are two ways of handling. The first one is, 
you don't have a, workers do not have money to spend, right? And then you, there is a simple way of the boosting consumption. So simply, we can provide a cheap credit to, work, to workers and poor households. That's exactly what happened in the United States. So they provide the cheap credit to the old ordinary workers, and then they can buy. They maintain the consumption, if you like, and based on this. And we know the result. This strategy is not sustainable. At the end of the day, we have the, the financial crisis in the United States. The second option is you simply export more. So you have a problem in your country, but you simply export your problems as well to other countries. Okay, so that's what happened in China and Germany. That's why in the, right now, the Germany actually has been severely criticized for their selfishness because they actually keep the wages down like this and the baby income share is falling, but they manage to grow simply by exporting more to their neighboring country, like Greece, Spain, and Italy. Sounds familiar to you know, what happened in these countries. But this is typical the beggar thine neighbors policies. And of course, this is not viable either. It is not vi viable either because if you want to export more, there should be a country who are willing to import more. Right? So this country will have the problem as they are, even worse. There are only small pocket of the countries who can enjoy this actually unique strategy. So globally speaking, this strategy is not working. And then, okay, this is something a very sad story. So we're trying to turn around, doing some dissimulation. Okay, labor income share has been falling. Then, what if countries all together probably somehow, for some reason, decide to increase labor income share by 1%? Then what's going to happen? So that's kind of the simulation we did. Uh, I don't want to get into detail in here. The result is, there is a very significant effect on the economic growth, or positive effect. Economy will grow, and especially the effect will be much bigger if the older countries maintain the labor income shares at the level 20 years back. So probably I get into it very quickly. Our assumption is somehow the older country here maintain the level of the labor income share around the 1980s then probably what would be the net effect of the economic growth is very, very significant. So that is the, the, what this chart shows. Probably you can see all the details in our the report. Then probably so far it is all abstract. Probably it's all global. You know, it's, uh, it's like the, I'm working for the internet IMF or something. Uh, but I'm just putting you in the context, the career. Korea in social policy, as far as I know, Korea has been praised for many reasons. One of the big, uh, big reasons for that is that Korea managed to grow, yes, but in a rather equitable manner, meaning the income inequality has been reduced, although the economic growth was very high. So that's why the Korea is always called a champion of equitable growth. But that's past story. It's all gone. Okay, so this is one example. In Korea, the, if you look at the uh, labor income share, so there is a very nice story going up and going up until 1997. I just hope you remember the year of 97 throughout the, uh, the end of the uh, presentation on Korea. So 97, that's when the financial crisis broke out. Before that, we had a moment of the, the big shift for the, uh, the direct democracy, and also the, all of a sudden workers began to organize, and there is a big push on social policies in Korea. So thanks to that, all the, in the context of those policies, labor income share increased quite significantly, and then all of a sudden falling down a little bit. And that's not the end of the story. If we look at the trend between uh, real wages, wage growth, and labor productivities, all of a sudden in Korea start to see the gap is growing between labor productivity and wages. When? 97. 97 is when the financial crisis broke out in Korea. So the gap is simply growing. 
Okay, so now no wonder income inequality in Korea, either personal income distribution or the functional income distribution, as we did, we saw, all increasing. Then what about these poor workers, poor households? So we look at the low pay incidence. The same story. Around the 90, uh, late 1980s, the Korea started to see the uh, low pay incidence is decreasing thanks to a lot of the policy initiative, including minimum wages, all the nice things. But all of a sudden, it all stopped. That's when 97. That's financial crisis. And then start to increase. That trend is more or less continued at the moment. And the final piece of the story is that the, okay, I have to rush up. Uh, you may think that Korea is always exporting more than import, but which is not the case. Before, at least before financial crisis, Korean economy always import more than export. That's a way of the growing the economy. So the, in terms of trade, actually, the, before the 97, Korea had always had the trade the, uh, deficits. So that, ha that problem has been always tackled by you know, the changing exchange rate. But all of a sudden, after 97, the Korean economy is translated in, uh, transform itself into the trade surplus countries. So all of a sudden, net export increasing. That makes perfect sense because, the, as I said, labor income share is a falling, unit, labor unit cost is a falling. In doing so, the Korean economy always managed to handle their problems through by, simply by exporting more than imports. So this is what happened in Korea. So probably the, the, the Dr. Il Chung Lee knows about this very well. So. He has the full picture of that policy changes. All what all of these tell us, possibly, the, okay, we can back, get back to the question, why labor income share has been falling in the first instance? And what has been the economic consequences? Just from the very dis descriptive actual statistics on the key trend, you may suspect ever, for some reason everything happens after financial crisis. After financial crisis, what happened in Korea? There is a big pulse shift under the pressure from the IMF towards liberalization policies. Labor market has been flexibilized. There is the big uh, li uh, liberalization of the financial sectors, on and on and on. So this period is coincided with a big policy shift in Korea as well. So this is all empirical evidence so far. So I try. I'm doing okay also. Yeah. Okay. So what? I no, I'm not asking you. So I'm asking it to myself. So, so what? So, so this is a nice data or nice analysis. So what? Uh, uh, of course, I have to admit I'm still reflecting on these issues. And so, so this is a good opportunity for me to actually share my thinking. Also, I'm happy to hear from you what you are thinking about this. Observation number one, if you remember all the empirical evidence I present, is that labor income share trend is something to do with policy shift. As you remember, in the advanced countries, when actually labor income share started to fall, that's 1980s. As you remember what happened in 1980s, big shift to neoliberal policies, right? And in other countries, that actually is, uh, change started about the 1990s, around 1990s, early or delayed. In, in Korea, it's 97. That's exactly when policy shift occurred. Just one question. Yep, yep. If the trend had not reversed and the share of labor had continued to go up, mm -hmm. in which year would the share of wage reach 200% of? No, that's not, that's, a, that's a not possible, actually. So, yeah. yeah, maybe precisely that's something we should take. Actually, we, yeah, we haven't calculated, so maybe, that's something yeah. I will do. So I will send the email. <laughs> it will take a couple of minutes to calculate that, yeah. Good, I would be very curious to okay. that figure. I will, before I forget, yeah.
<laughs> and that's a observation number one. Number two is, so probably, we, we said that the probably growing inequality is not very good for economy as either. So we have to probably put it back. But how can we do that? Then probably, again, we need a, a completely different thinking or approach to the policy. Unless we change our policies, we may not expect any significant change in income distribution. That's our guess from the, what we have seen from empirical evidence. And third one is, okay, coolness. I really, I really feel sorry for the coolness. Coolness always brings, you know, you, you have, so your theory is somehow actually encourage economists to completely ignore the inequality. But that's not what actually Kuznets said in his original paper. In his paper, what he said is that, of course, at a certain point, inequality uh, start to fall, not because of economic reason, because of the political social reasons. Inequality is growing. People, all of a sudden, very much worried about social cohesion and other, other issues, and the workers start to organize themselves to increase the pressure on the policymakers and the politicians. That's exactly what happened in Germany and the UK and other countries. Mm -hmm. So probably if we understand the Kuznets more accurately or more in line with what he said in his paper, like in 1953 uh, papers, and probably we may have a different view on the inequality issues. Uh, this is another big story. In my guess, it, it has something to do with the Karl Polanyi's conundrum. I think probably you all know about this. Karl Polanyi basically said, in the, said the, you know, there is always tension between the market and the society, so sometimes the, going to the neoliberal and the commodifying everything, and if it reaches the extreme, as the pendulum moving back to the more uh, state or uh, the uh, state of society regulations to decommodify the labor and land or something like that. So it, it, it sounds like as if the penendulum is moving always like that automatically. But now, the, if we, or probably what actually Prime said is the, he actually identified the people who are moving the pen, the, 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 the pendulum. In the in the case of the United uh, the United States. They are organized workers and enlightened actually businessmen who actually organize themselves to putting pressure on Roosevelt basically to change the policies. But in this crisis, surprisingly, we do not see that. Why? Because this uh, the pendulum is not automatic. Somebody should carry it over. But I don't see who they are at the moment. That's where we have problem. That's the observation number three. And so, the, in terms of the, the policy, the what, we, what policy we should look at, uh, probably it's um, uh, pretty much obvious. We actually propose three things. One is, the bottom line is that we have to make effort to reconnect wage and productivities. And this is not actually a single man show. One country can do that, but it has a limited impact because there are all different strategies. You know, countries may have a different strategies. So there is a strong need for the coordination at the global level. Of, in doing so, actually, labor market institutions should be strengthened. Particularly, our, we are concerned about the uh, rather unbalanced the bargaining position right now between workers and the, uh, the companies at the moment. And as I said, the more important issue, probably more urgent issue is the financial regulation. Uh, that is the concern. Why, the, as you can see later, companies are sitting on lots of cashes at the moment, but they don't make investment. Why? Because they used, they used to invest this money in the financial commodities or financial, you know, the financial market, broadly speaking, but they cannot do it now. But they are still very unwilling to put their money in the real investment. So that, as a result, they are sitting on the big pile of the cash at the moment. And the taxation and social security is a very important part of the story, but I don't want to you know, the, uh, spend time on this because you are all experts on this. And for developing countries, 
uh, we are particularly concerned about the, uh, the informal sectors, and I'm getting into there in a, in a minute, and also social security schemes. And the finance sector, this is some simple uh, the, uh, the trend. We actually estimate uh, the uh, dividend payout uh, between 2000 and 2011. It doesn't matter. Crisis, forget it. It's simply increasing. The, you may expect that the crisis period, the dividend pay payment, I, by definition, economic performance is worse, then dividend payment should be smaller, but that's not what happened. It's increasing. There is a bit of a hiccup around 2007, but it started to grow. We have a fundamental problem with here. Companies have lots of the capacity to invest. They do have resources, but they simply don't do it. That has something to do with the current status of the financial market regulation and other issues. And when it comes to labor market issues, uh, we think, yes, labor, uh, the uh, labor market policies are important, but it's not working always very well. Uh, uh, two aspects. You may say collective bargaining is improving, then probably the low pay incidence will be decreasing. Yes, that is true, uh, but the, the relationship is not very strong. And uh, this is uh, something we are looking into there as well. And also the minimum wage is the same. Uh, people may always suggest the minimum wage as a way of protecting low pay workers, but this is a more subtle business. If the, of course, if you have minimum wages at the too low level, it doesn't matter. But if minimum wage is too high, it is not going to be enforced in any case. That's why we look at the relationship between minimum wages here and the low pay insurance is high and increasing as minimum wages are going up. And then if minimum wages are going up further, low pay insurance is increasing. Why? Because these minimum wages are very high. They are not relevant for low paid workers. They are not being enforced. So that's why there is uh, some U-shaped curve. Uh, we explain these uh, the issues in the, our special issues of the uh, International Labor Review. I'm, I think I'm under time pressure. Uh, so I think the, the labor market policy itself is useful but not completely effective. And this is something we are looking at now. Uh, we are trying to distinguish two different things. One is the wage poverty and is income poverty. So why we worry about wages? Because we want to protect workers from the poverty by providing reasonably sufficiently high wages. But sometimes, even though the, the, the workers uh, receive some the reasonable, reasonable in court uh, wages, they may, may not be sufficient to, uh, to get out of the poverty at the household level because the poverty is normally defined at household level. So the, there is a way of, uh, of the kind of the disconnecting the, the linkage between the wages and poverty uh, through some of the income, the uh, support. Uh, but we, we, especially for the second type of risk, we, we are thinking of the old income rate policies, but all, all the examples provided in this slide actually have been strongly advocated by unrisk. That's my understanding. But the key point, I don't have an answer to that, but our gut feeling is that we have been doing quite okay on the labor market side. Probably we have done quite okay on the probably social security or income policy side, okay. But we still don't know how to best articulate or integrate, integrate these two set of policies to make, to produce the maximum effect for the poor household. So we are doing our own technical expertise, but we are not very good at actually putting them together to produce effective active policy framework. Probably that's just for ILO, but uh, so sometimes when we're looking at the other uh, the reports on the social policies, they, they are not very uh, articulate on the labor market side either. So this is a two-sided story. Uh, I think we hope, I, I hope actually, uh, in the future there is a better actually understanding of these two issues and to have a better uh, policy suggestions uh, which actually put uh, those 
two sets of policies in a more effective way. So this is my final slide, and this is, this is actually Joanna asked me to do. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> uh, actually, ILO is also talking about MDGs. So last time, ILO somehow managed to uh, managed to bring out uh, bring in our issues into MDG last minute, basically. We just managed it. So now the MDG, current MDG, recognize the importance of the employment. That's it. And there is a bit of the issues related to gender and others, uh, but child, and but it's a bit marginal from our perspective. And we do have problem with that because full employment is a good idea. We always advocate it, but in different countries, full employment doesn't make much sense because at the end of the day, workers are fully employed. In the sense that the, if you don't have a job in the company, you just go, to, go out to the street or selling something, then you are classified as being employed. So that's why employment rate in different countries is always higher than middle income countries, by definition, because they, they cannot afford being unemployed. So the full employment itself doesn't make much sense. So we think the, some of the drug quality dimensions should be included, that's why. But that is not related to my presentation itself. The, my uh, thinking is that the, the next MDG, if I understand the MDG is some kind of platform for kind of shaping new socioeconomic paradigm for more sustainable, equitable growth. In that case, this actually new MDG should explicitly recognize the issue of inequality. The current MDG tends to emphasize more on the inequality equality in opportunities. I, I fully agree that's important, but that's not enough. We have to recognize the importance of inequality in terms of outcome as well, so income as well. So unless we do that, uh, there is a significant risk, again, not just in the uh, social outcome, but also in economic outcome. So I just hope this, uh, this issue will be reflected in the next, uh, uh, the uh, first kind of discussion on the MDG. And final question is that the, it's more political question. Also that has been my question uh, for the last two or three years. Uh, I'm a researcher, uh, so of course provide some of the policy advice to different countries. Uh, it's always say very nice things about this. But at the end of the day, I, I just keep wondering, who's going to do this? Okay, now I said, okay. I, I said, okay, to be fair, I said I made a, you know, I made a very strong call for rebalancing in the income distribution. Otherwise, we would have been in trouble. So that's what I said, basically. And then the next question I should ask is that, okay, who's going to take that issue on board and to trying to push and changing the policies? The, if we, we can ask ourselves if the existing political system or the politicians and policymakers are willing to do so, if they actually see the points, okay, inequality is important, Obama says lots of things about this, would that be enough to turn the wheel? Or the most important issue for us is to identify who will be social forces which actually take this agenda to the politics. Probably there is a way of doing that. So, and then the following question is who they are? Where are they? We used to rely very much on trade unions. That's what happened in the, uh, the Great Depression in the 1920s, 30s. But when we are looking around, they are not there. So, Why? yeah? Why? But that's my question. <laughs> So then the question is, are we going to we strengthen the trade union? Would that be, then the question is, would that be a good strategy at this particular moment? Or we have to look for alternative social forces as well. 
or we have to be more creative <coughs> about this issue. That is pretty much open question. I don't have any uh, answer to that. I hope actually the, you in this room will have a time to think about it, or if you have already some good uh, interview on this, I would be very happy to listen to that. <coughs>